The men who fought and suffered in troubled times are passing one by one. Of none can it be said that they gave more unselfish and devoted service than Tom Markham. Hello, my name is Joe Murrahertig and that's the last line of an obituary for Tom Markham that appeared in the Irish press in 1939. Markham is the subject of this lecture for the Clare County Library as part of its Decade of Centenaries programme. This is the Dublin team in Crow Park on the 21st of November 1920. The majority of them are native dubs and in that majority the biggest representation is from the O'Toole's Club which was near enough to Croke Park. Among the interlopers you have Kildare man Frank Burke who would win All-Irelands in hurling and football and the Clare man, the above mentioned Tom Markham. He's a largely forgotten Clare man even though his name gets honourable mention every year thanks to the All-Ireland Minor Football Championship trophy that's named after him. Markham is third from left in the photograph on the back row. Three people over you have Frank Burke, who was a student of Porrick Pierce in St. Enda's in Rathfarnham. A further four people over is Johnny MacDonald. He was a famous Dublin footballer, but also an IRA man. On the front row, first left is Tom Ennis, another footballer who was also an IRA man. They were in Croke Park because of this match. The game between the two best teams in Ireland at the time, Tipperary and Dublin. Macdonald and Ennis had gone into action of a different kind earlier that morning, killing a few spies up on Mount Street before finding refuge from the Black and Tan War in Croke Park with their beloved dubs, only for the war to come to them. It came to them because this was Bloody Sunday, one of the most infamous episodes in the War of Independence when arising from events in the city over the course of 24 hours, 32 people died. Fifteen were assassinated that morning at various lodgings around the city. They were members of the Cairo gang. There were 14 casualties in Croke Park in the afternoon when the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries exacted revenge. Michael Hogan, the Tipperary player after whom the Hogan stand is named, is the most prominent. Then the mayhem continued when three more were murdered in Dublin Castle that night. Those final three casualties were Dick McKee, Pather Clancy and Connor Clune. Clancy and Clune were Clare men, while McKee was inextricably linked to the man in the picture, Tom Markham. This lecture will explore the remarkable life and times inside and outside the GAA of Tom Markham. He was a British civil servant, but an Irish volunteer and an IRA man, a gun runner, a veteran of Easter week, a social activist, a champion of the sick during a global pandemic, an Irish language activist, a youth worker, a newspaper editor and writer. And he was a controversial figure. The Bloody Sunday picture is a good starting point for his story. Because of his involvement in the struggle for freedom. Even though he's always the last Clareman referenced when it comes to Bloody Sunday. Pather Clancy and Connor Clune take pride of place. Clune was from Quinn and was an Irish language enthusiast who worked for Edward MacLyset at his co-op business out in Tomb Grainy in East Clare. He travelled to Dublin that morning with MacLyset on business. 
he was arrested in a raid on Vaughan's Hotel in Parnell Square, where he was meeting a friend of his. He was arrested because he wasn't a registered guest. The police were looking for Collins, McKee and Clancy, who were also in the hotel, having met earlier as part of the planning for the IRA blitz of the Cairo gang members. McKee and Clancy were later picked up early on Sunday morning and all three men were brought to Dublin Castle for interrogation. In the hours after the events of Bloody Sunday, it was alleged that all three men were killed when trying to escape. This is accepted as being untrue. They were tortured in order to extort confessions from them and the names of the volunteers who had earlier that morning shot the members of the Cairo gang. Refusing to talk, they were murdered. Markham knew Clancy and McKee well from his involvement in the Irish Volunteers and the IRA. When the 2nd Battalion of the Volunteers was reorganised after the Easter Rising, Markham was a member, while the OC was Dick McKee. But Markham's involvement in all things Irish nationalism, be it the Volunteers, the GEA, the Gaelic League and more, predates that of when Clune, Clancy or McKee became involved principally because he was much older. In 1920 he was 42 and a veteran of many different campaigns. He was born in 1878 in Craig Bryan, which is a couple of miles outside of Ennis on the way to Ballinacalli. He moved to Dublin in the late 1890s to take up a post in the civil service. In the 1911 census, he's listed as Thomas O'Mark Coyne, an assistant clerk with the local government board, while he is also down as a writer on economics and literature. And by having his name in Irish, you straight away know that he is an Irish language activist. This and his writing would have started many years before that in Dublin, where he emerged as an outspoken and prolific writer and organiser when it came to the GEA and other organisations of national interest. He may have been working in the British Civil Service, but he was staunchly nationalist when it came to divorcing Ireland from British rule. We can see this as early as 1903, a year when he would have just turned 25 but he was already deeply involved in the GEA and the Gaelic League. September of that year was the centenary of the execution of Robert Emmett, and there was a major commemoration in his honour in Dublin. The Gaelic Athletic Association will make an interesting and formidable display, said the Freeman's Journal. Hurlers will carry commands and intermix as far as possible with footballers. All the clubs in the city were invited to take part, but the Ku Cullens club that Thomas Markham had helped established earlier that year decided it wouldn't be appropriate to take part. The majority of the club's members were civil servants, wrote Markham nearly 40 years later and deemed it unwise to take official part. A few members, however, disagreed with the majority and resigned from the club. Markham was one of those. He was too welded to the ideas of Robert Emmett to toe the line of the club and instead left and set up another club called the Archbishop Croaks. The moral of the story there is that Markham wasn't going to let his job as a civil servant come between him and his principles when it came to Ireland. It was a sign of things to come. In that sense, you could say he was a bit of a maverick, just like his fellow county man and the founder of the GA, Michael Cusick, was years before that. Cusick died in 1906, at the age of 59. 
It can be assumed, I think, that Markham knew him in Dublin. After all, they were both GA activists, they were hurling men, and they also lived in the city. But there was another thing that linked them. Markham was a prolific writer, just as Cusack was. Cusack set up his own newspaper, the Celtic Times, in 1887, just as Tom Markham set up his own newspaper, The Champion, in 1903. We see The Champion advertised in on Clive Sullish, calling it the new Gaelic Athletic Weekly, with articles in Irish and English by prominent writers. Reports on Gaelic matches and items of interest to all Irish Irelanders. It could just as easily have been an advert for the Celtic Times because Cusack's newspaper was like Markham's. Cusack regularly used his columns in his newspaper to take aim at the GEA and Tom Markham was just the same in the champion. And this was shown to be true during the biggest controversy that emerged during the champion's short shelf life on the newsstands. That was the suspension of the Clonmel Shamrocks Club from the GAA. In 1902, they played Galway in the 1900 All-Ireland Football Final. Before the final, they wrote to the Central Council of the GAA seeking expenses for the players who made the journey up to Dublin. They were told they'd get the money, but subsequently the Central Council reneged on that. The net result was that the Clonmel Shamrocks Club went to court and got a judgment against the Central Council. But on foot of that then, the Central Council turned around and suspended Clonmel Shamrocks from the GEA, initially for a period of a couple of months, but then after they had been reinstated at the annual convention of the GEA, they were subsequently then banned from the GEA for all time at a reconvened convention. This is where Tom Markham comes in, with the nationalist newspaper in Clonmel reporting that the champion, a new Dublin weekly devoted to the Gaelic Athletic Association, devotes its leader to a scathing exposition of the action of the present governing body of the association regarding the treatment meted out to Clonmel Shamrocks. Markham called on Gales to make a complete change in the Central Council in the interests of our national sports and pastimes. And in taking this stand, he was going against some huge figures in the GAA. People like Luke O'Toole, pictured here with Michael Collins and Harry Boland. He was secretary of the GAA nationally from 1901 to 1929. Another man was Alderman James Nolan. He was president of the GEA from 1901 to 1921. And a third man was Dan Fraher, who was a noted athlete and a, a seasoned Munster Council official. Markham, in his article and in his attack really on the Central Council of the GEA, gave a list of about 40 clubs who supported the Shamrocks in their fight against what he called the cheese pairing and vindictive action of the gentlemen who presently control the GEA. It shows that Markham wasn't afraid to take on the establishment, just like Michael Cusick wasn't before him. And this is a trait that he maintained throughout his association in the GEA. The following year, he was one of the driving forces behind the establishment of the Irish Brigade. In Irish it was called Slua na Heron. This was a new national organisation that was established after a meeting in the Mansion House. Included in its membership were people like Thomas O'Donnell MP. He was from the Dingle Peninsula and he created a name for himself a few years earlier when making his maiden speech in the House of Commons in Irish. In launching the Irish Brigade and writing about in his newspapers, Markham spoke about the insidious work of England, 
presiding over a system of education cunningly devised to uproot our national traditions. Deadening our intellects, paralysing our energies and chilling our national aspirations. It is time that we arrived at the parting of the ways, he wrote. And chief among his policies, I suppose, to achieve this was the first step of this great work is the introduction of native games and pastimes into schools and colleges. We shall nationalise Ireland through the youth of Ireland, he said. We shall break down selfless opposition to our country's cause by means of national cohesion. Shoulder to shoulder we must labour if we want to make Ireland a nation. The Irish Brigade didn't win the support of the GA and ultimately didn't have a long life, but that early manifesto proved that Markham was ahead of his time in calling for the introduction of the GEA into schools and colleges. We could see that in the following decade when competitions like the Sigerson Cup and the Fitzgibbon Cup were introduced into the universities and say the flagship hurling competition Munster, the Harty Cup started in 1918. By that time though it's safe to say that Markham had moved on to a different brigade. You could call it another Irish brigade as in the Irish Volunteers, that were established in 1913 and within a year had become armed with Markham playing his part. I think it's safe to assume that he was among the 7,000 crowd that were present in Parnell Square in 1913 when the Volunteers were established by Owen McNeil, who was a Gaelic Lee colleague of Markham's. And the fact that he was a respected member of the Volunteers with a rank and a standing within the organisation was illustrated a few months later when he was a contributing writer to the Irish Volunteer. That was the newspaper produced by the new organisation. He was in good company in that issue as other contributors were Arthur Griffith and Eamon Kant. And he was in similar company later that year when taking part in the Holt gun running. The Bureau of Military History witness statement of Frank Henderson reveals Markham's prominent role in what happened concerning the shipment of arms that came ashore in the Asgard. Beforehand we were told we were going to Holt for a march, but some people didn't know we were going for arms, wrote Henderson. Tom Markham told me, but it was kept secret from most of the men. Less than two years later, Markham was also out, this time with fellow members of the E Company of the 2nd Battalion, when they assembled in Father Matthew Park in Fairview on Easter Sunday. He didn't have far to travel that day, as his home was less than 500 yards away. Again, we know of this through the Bureau of Military History witness statements. On arrival, I found a large number of volunteers, but not the entire 2nd Battalion, wrote Charles Sorlin in his witness statement. Captain Tom Weefer was the senior officer present. I recognised Tom Markham looking very soldierly with a short belted trench coat, a Stetson hat, top boots and a formidable automatic in a holster at his side. Markham subsequently saw action in the rebellion that started the following day, being involved in the GPO area and the Annesley Bridge area and he was slightly injured and after the rising he was arrested and detained in Richmond Barracks for a while. But it's in his pension application to the Irish government in the 1920s that we learn of his greater role and his emergence of a spy for Michael Collins during the War of Independence period. In 1918, I was one of the chief sources of intelligence working directly with Dick McKee and to a lesser extent with Pader Clancy, he wrote. After 1919, when Collins took over intelligence, I worked almost exclusively with him 
and under various names, chiefly Tom Donovan. Continuing, he said, I was the only man in the civil service who was directed to take the oath of allegiance and the only civil servant, as far as I know, who continued to be a member of the volunteers. He said Collins did not act on a whim when early in 1922 he placed me against my wishes and in order to save the treaty in charge of Dublin Castle. The British government knew something of me when its then War Minister Laming Evans wrote confidentially to Alfred Cope, who was Lloyd George's man in Dublin Castle. He said, it is too bitter a pill to swallow to have a member of Collins' murder gang in control of what was the centre of British government in Ireland for centuries. So in his application for a pension in the 1920s, Markham makes some big claims with regard to his involvement with Michael Collins as a spy. But there are people who also contribute to that pension application who vouch for Markham's bona fides. People like Liam Tobin. He said he was the most important to the intelligence department because of his particular occupation. Another man was Sean Colbert. He said this man, on account of his official position, was not naturally in the limelight. But the old crowd know very well the risks taken and the services rendered in the area of intelligence work by Tom Donovan. He was an intimate friend of Dick McKee. To my knowledge, McKee was constantly in his company and during the hottest period of the Anglo-Irish War, Collins was in the closest personal touch with him. It's safe to say that the hottest period of all in that Anglo-Irish War was on Bloody Sunday. And Jimmy Slattery, who took part in the manoeuvres on Bloody Sunday morning, he was another Clare man, he was a member of Collins' squad, one of the Twelve Apostles as it were. He also vouched for Markham in that pension application. As did Tom Ennis, who was pictured with him in Crow Park later that afternoon at the match between Tipperary and Dublin. And add in the fact that if Markham was an intimate friend of Dick McKee and a key intelligence man for Michael Collins, it's inconceivable that he wouldn't have known what was going to happen in Dublin that Sunday morning. Dick McKee was put in charge of planning the operation and Collins' plan initially was that 50 men would be targeted and killed, but that was eventually rounded down to 20. Then after that came the reprisals in Crow Park. As a GA man, but also a volunteer and an IRA man, what happened in Crow Park that day could only have hardened Markham's views. And then it was in subsequent years that his role as a spy for Collins came into more prominence, just because the documentary evidence of that work survives to this day. Other spies like Ned Broy, who was immortalised in Neil Jordan's film Michael Collins, and David Nelligan, who wrote a book on his exploits called The Spy in the Castle, are more prominent, while Markham rarely gets mentioned. But the evidence is there. For instance, in the Richard Mulcahy papers, we see a number of letters. One letter he wrote to Michael Collins, and he said, The road to the Castle Hill is paved with anonymous letters, he said. The depth and widespread character of this treacherous anonymity would almost make a good Irishman despair of his country. These anonymous letters dealt with every conceivable national activity, said Markham. Where the arms were hidden, what so-and-so proposed at a volunteer meeting, where prominent men were located, proposed attacks on barracks. Some of these letters may have been inspired by motives of cowardice, said Markham, but from internal evidence, I conclude that most of them had their origins in motives of jealousy. After Collins' death in August 1922, Markham then wrote directly to Richard Mulcahy, effectively informing him of the job he was doing for Collins. In a letter, he says, I have discovered some rather sensational stuff. 
spies letters, applications for jobs, confidential reports. From information I supplied to me Hall, he agreed that the utmost care and confidence should be exercised with respect to these documents. Otherwise, guns might continue to click for many a year. It's these files that Markham allegedly had and subsequently disappeared that have been a source of regret for historians for many years. Files that Markham allegedly took out of Dublin Castle maybe for fear that they would be destroyed after he was subsequently sidelined after Michael Collins's death by what would become the Common Gael government that refused him his IRA pension in the 1925-26 period. And a hint of what he had in his possession is contained in a letter that Markham wrote to John Devoy in 1924. He said, my reason for writing to you is to establish the identity of spies. I have a list of payments to informants. I have located some of these. For the purposes of history, it would be a pity not to locate as many of these spies as possible, he said. And finishing his letter to the old Fenian leader, Devoy, he said, I could not see you in the presence of any official of government. No man knows more about the bright side of the Fenian movement than you do, and circumstances give me the chance of peeping into the dark side. Devoy happened to be in Ireland at the time that he got this letter from Markham. He was here for six weeks from July to September 1924 and officially opened the Talton Gaines in Crow Park. But we don't know if Devoy and Markham ever met. While we also don't know what happened to the papers that Markham was going to show to Devoy. Just as the book that Markham was talking about writing during this period never appeared before he died in 1939. But away from that, Markham still did make his mark, principally in the GEA and his continued writing about national affairs. Where the GEA is concerned, he became chairman of the Dublin Minor Board in 1930. He had set up another GEA club called the Desmonds, and that team effectively backboned the Dublin Minor team that won the All Ireland title in 1930. Another example was in Crow Park itself. Having been there on Bloody Sunday in 1920, like everyone else, he was an enthusiastic supporter of the building of the Hogan Stand in honour of Michael Hogan. While in the 1930s, when his fellow countyman Michael Cusack was being honoured with a stand, he supported that as well. But Markham went further and said that there was another man who should be honoured in this way as well. And that man was P.W. Nally. Numerous persons would greatly regret if the opportunity were allowed pass linking the name of Cusick and his comrade in the Gaelic gallery, said Markham. The Mayo and the Clare man planned together the GAA. They were to the association what Thomas Davis and Charles Gavin Duffy were to the nation. The Nally name deserves to be treasured in the national remembrance of Crow Park, he said. It eventually happened when the Nally stand was erected in 1952. Away from the GEA, Markham was chairman of the National Boy Scouts of Ireland in the 1920s. Before that, he was a driving force of the Dublin-based organisation that was raising funds for the families of those affected by the Great Flu in the Ennis area in 1918. While his social activism around where he lived in Fairview was illustrated by the fact that he was involved in the United Plot Holders Union. It was Markham who put forward a plan to build 300 Dublin Corporation social houses in Marino at the cost of £150,000. And those houses were eventually built and that area became a power base for the St Vincent's Club that emerged to dominate Dublin GEA from the 50s onwards. The big constants though for Markham were the GEA and the national movement. 
He was chairman of the Sean Coles Club up until he died in 1939, while he wrote about the GAA and the freedom struggle in the Wolf Tone Weekly under the name of Dal Cashin. This was the newspaper edited by Brian O'Higgins. He was the former head of the Irish College in Carrigaholt in West Clare, while he later became an MP and a TD for West Clare. By this time, Markham had got his IRA pension and was appointed by the Fianna Fáil government that came to power in 1932 to a post in the military pensions department. And in that job, he did his best to treat applicants better than he had been treated by the same system himself in the 1920s. One story shows this when an old man entered his office one day. You're looking for a military pension, said Markham. I am. But surely you didn't fight in any of our recent wars. You weren't in the Civil War or the Black and Tan War. No, came the response. You weren't in Easter Week. No, again. Well then, might I ask when you fought? I fought in 67, came the reply. I'm afraid that hardly comes under the Act, said Markham. But I'm glad to meet an old Fenian. Who was your commanding officer? Nobody. In my own area, I was the commanding officer, came the response. I was the Fenian centre for Ulster and Scotland. Tom paused and then asked, Might I ask your name, sir? After he gave it, Tom Markham sprang to his feet and saluted him. He recognised his name from the Dublin Castle files that were in his possession. I'm proud to know you, said Markham. The Irish press journalist who recalled the story after Tom's death said, if the old Fenian chief didn't get his pension, it was not the fault of Tom Markham. And that politics and the GEA were there in Markham to the last. You could say the very last, in fact. His last newspaper column that he wrote before he died showed that. The very last paragraph of that column brought his principles and the GEA together in a few sentences. It was about the 1889 All-Ireland Hurling Final that was played in Inchicore between Tuller Robert Emmets and Dublin Kickhams. Writing about the game, Markham said, Rain fell heavily all throughout Saturday, turning the pitch into the condition of a ploughed field. The Kickhams enjoyed the advantage of spiked shoes. The Clareman played in their bare feet and kept slipping continuously. Dublin's success was rather due to the slipping of the Dalcashians, he said. But here comes the final paragraph. On the night of the match, there was a conference of Clare and Dublin Fenians. The games were definitely linked up with the national traditions and aspirations. Will the present generation begin to make up for lost ground? That was the question posed by Markham. In Markham's mind, you could say the GAA was welded to the struggle for freedom that day as much as it was on Bloody Sunday. That was Tom Markham in many ways. He was the spy, he was the civil servant, he was the volunteer, but still he was the forgotten man. But he was a man who certainly played his part. In many ways, he was a GEA revolutionary. That brings an end to the lecture and I hope you enjoyed it.